Okay, so it started with a book. Now, since we've been working remotely and building, nurturing remote teams for years, we thought we'd share everything we've learned. And people seem to like it, but we can't stop there, can we? Why are you keeping this curiosity door locked? Okay, okay, okay. So we have created Ready for Remote, the platform. But what is it? It's where you and your company can get access to everything you need to help you get ready for remote working. Insights, tools, jobs, and workspaces, we've got it covered. We are changing the way people work for the better by challenging the status quo and helping companies work remotely. Why? Better talent, greater diversity, higher productivity, more space, happier employees, and a lower carbon footprint. Yes, Leo, you heard that right. Ready? Let's go. Head over to readyforremote.com now. Hey everyone, it's Michael Fair from BIT here. I uh, hope you're all well. I'm here with uh, Gary Walker from uh, 22 North, um, author of the book Ready for Remote uh, and the website readyforremote.com. Um, he also does conference speaking um, on digital disruption, remote working and employee experience. How are you getting on, Gary? Are you well? Yeah, very well. Very well. Thanks, Michael. Good. Awesome. So uh, I suppose just jump right in then, Gary. So uh, so why remote? Yeah, um, it's a question I've been asked many times. Um, I've been working remotely for mm -hmm. 13 years now. Um, so yeah, I mean, first thing I would like to say, given the situation at the moment, the pandemic and the awful situation that people are going through is this isn't remote working as you would traditionally know it. This is people at home trying to work during a crisis. But if we go back to that sort of question, why remote in a traditional sense? I mean, there's so many benefits for the company, for the employees as well. Um, it makes sense and it's not a question of uh, everybody sitting and working from home, it's giving people a freedom and a choice to, to work from where they choose to work from. Um, so yeah, I mean your your talent starts to open up in terms of your talent pool because you can hire globally um, and because of that diversity starts to improve and that brings massive benefits if you've got services and products because you've got a culturally diverse group of people that are looking through the lens of those different cultures and how they can improve those products and services. Productivity, it's, it's, I mean, there's so many studies and research and reports showing the productivity gains from people going remote. Um, but that, that's got to be countered and balanced because there's an element of the well-being and um, it's an emphasis of really creating deeper focus time and more time for people rather than them feeling overwhelmed. Um, and then you'll start to see the productivity gains because people are getting measured on productivity and outcomes rather than visibility like you would traditionally be in an office. And then from a company's perspective, because of that, you start to get more engaged, happier employees. But the biggest benefit from a company's perspective is the carbon footprint. I mean, the impact on climate, the less travel, and then yeah. you look at the massive cost savings, operational cost savings of commercial real estate and the ability to renegotiate those leases as well. So yeah, um, a, fair, a fairly lengthy list there. <laughs> no, it's awesome. I mean, I think uh, landlords, yeah, <laughs> are not uh, for some, yeah. I mean, some some people uh, looking at like doubling their uh, their office size because they're trying to get them back in, uh, whereas they just be thinking like you know do the remote and uh, you save all that money. Well, that's the thing. I've got nothing against landlords or anything. I think commercial real estate is in a difficult situation, like a lot of a lot of businesses at the moment. And I don't think I think if people sign leases, then they should really be committed to. I mean seen through those leases or even renegotiating those leases but i think it's given companies uh, the ability to rethink what those office spaces is a the size of, and the space that they need and also what that space looks like and um, most progressive organizations in the world either they don't have offices or they have satellite offices where people can get together and it gives people the freedom of hey i actually want that maybe i want a bit of interaction or i want to go in an office today and um, so i can see that sort of shifting so yeah yeah totally and obviously, um, you know, we, we kind of came about um, our engagement, Gary, through um, one of our clients um, looking for support. Um, and, and, and I mentioned this because of, you know, the, the, the thing of kind of like better talent. You know, so if this wasn't happening and, uh, and they wanted someone in Glasgow, we may not be chatting, you know, because you're not yeah. in Glasgow. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a really good example of, of, of what's happened at the moment, I suppose, that, you know, there's, uh, there's the remote talent across the UK. You're not going to define their location. You know? well, uh, and even more broadly in the UK, it's quite an exciting time. Like as difficult as it is right now in the recruitment business, I think it's an exciting time for people to rethink. So 
I mean, the great advantage of talent is just what you touched upon there. It's not localised talent. You've yeah. literally unlimited talent pool. Um, with that comes some changes that will need to happen from a cultural perspective within an organisation. But if you think of a recruitment company, the way to facilitate global workers, so there's lots of great um, companies that have started up over the last couple of years. There's one called Deal, D-E-E-L, Get Deal. Um, and they're facilitating all the kind of contracts and the legalities of those workers. But it's opening up that pool of uh, for the recruitment guys that they can really start to expand their scope and, uh, and their reach. So, yeah, it's an exciting time beyond, obviously, the, pand- the pandemic. So um, I'll keep on probably caveat in that in terms yeah. of obviously the, the terrible situation that's going on at the moment. So. Yeah, I know. It's... Uh... It's been it's been a, a a strange one, isn't it? It's not yeah. I mean, I'm used to doing like a day for home a week or something like that, or a couple of days. Um, BIT is kind of open to that, um, but not to this extent, you know. Like everyone's, yeah. you know, it's five days, um, and that kind of lack of like social interaction. I think that's why I'm maybe doing so many videos, <laughs> chatting yeah. to so many people. Um, but obviously, it seems that many employers, you know, and even employees as well, have kind of had their minds changed a lot i mean there was companies i know that were just like no remote working we don't do it and they've had to completely switch you know there's they had no choice they've had they've been pushed you know we have to go remote um you know they've had to turn all their servers on everyone's on it logging in remotely and we've got people logging in different ways as well we've still got companies where you know you're logging into like citrix you've got a remote desktop but there's still companies just now where they've got a pc turned on in the office and they're actually remote controlling them you know so there's all these different ways yeah. they're doing it which is mental, but obviously that you know that there is change there, um, in a sense how people are, are are kind of feeling about it. How are you kind of seeing it with the clients that you work with? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much kind of what you're describing there. I think um a lot of companies have thrown a lot of technology and, and tools at the problem, and I think that for those who've never done it before, it's understandable. It's kind of like, I mean, it's like giving someone a piano and asking them to play a piano when they've never done it before. They're going to struggle, like so, and I think. The mindset of those people is, is very much they're looking at the short-term tactical, let's ride out the storm. Um, I think we are organisations are maybe coping a little bit better. The ones that have started to rethink and their ways of working, their their culture, what, what does this look like as a longer-term strategy? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to be really interesting because I think what's going to happen is as this lockdown continues and, and let's be honest I don't think people returning to the office is, is on the, the immediate horizon I think the weaknesses of the survival plans will start to really um, come to the surface and, uh, and and that's natural because everyone's kind of energized at the start and they're like right okay we're geared towards this we've got new tools let's do it yeah but what you're also seeing is a lot of organizations because they've not done it before and because they don't have the right guidance a lot of them are replicating the office virtually and the power of remote working is more time it's more freedom it's it's having the ability to do deeper focused work and what i'm seeing across a lot of organizations is the replication of okay we had 10 meetings a day in the office let's have 10 meetings a day virtually you don't need to do that when you're working remotely so actually that's where the rethinking and the enlightened leaders come in um and that's really powerful because if you can start to rethink about okay actually we don't need to have a meeting all the time because let's be honest meetings are usually called for status updates or like people to give you some information that's not what a meeting should be for and if you get 10 people in an hour long meeting it's a 10 hour meeting it's not a one hour meeting so mm-hmm. people need to step back and rethink that and what remote does is it facilitates through the tools the ability to maybe create checkout channels start to write up some stuff and what that also gives you is the freedom as an employee to say you know what, I don't need to make a decision on that right now because if you're in an office and you're all sat around the table, not many people say, let me think about that and I'll come back to you because <laughs> there's a kind of pressure in the room yeah. to yeah, yeah. resolve something. Whereas yeah. when you're doing it asynchronously and remotely, then you've got that ability to say, you know what, guys, let's break this up. Um, and it, and meetings then start to become something like this where it's maybe personal so interviews or broader conversations when you're trying to overcome a barrier or a challenge. So, yeah. yeah. Not completely. It's also interesting as well. People uh, are kind of uh, tied to their emails, handcuffed to their emails as well. They'll kind of like see an email come in and they're like, I need to, you know, it's the instant reply. Um, I see Microsoft uh, release something and it kind of popped up like a month ago and said, Michael, like you need more focus time. Uh, you're on your emails too. And it, this is the computer told me this. And I'm like, yeah, enable focus. And it's just like blocks out all these times in my diary. 
yeah. um, you know, where you're, you're to get on because obviously it takes you time once you're doing something. And if you go to an email and you come back to it, you've kind of come out of that that focus, you know, of like the work you were doing. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. And like interruptions and remote working is where, and this is where you need the right cultural setup in the organization. So it's, it's mm-hmm. more about the mindset, the ways of working, and the behaviors within the organization. So, but you're absolutely right. Like most of the studies, I mean, it kind of averages between 19 and 21 minutes to refocus on a piece of work after an interruption. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of lost time. And I've seen, um, my analytics, which is part of Microsoft 365. And it's great to give people that kind of snapshot of, okay, you've been in 60% of meetings this week. And even Microsoft's last massive enterprise research showed that 20% of um, people's day is, is literally just finding the information they need. 28% is actually on email. So um, yeah, and then we've got 59% of people are saying that actually they're missing out on vital information because there's too much information <laughs> being shared within an organization. Yeah. So. I think there's like that pressure at the moment and whether it's email or, or whether it's uh, Microsoft Teams or Slack, if companies don't have the right behaviours and uh, principles behind it, then there's this anxiety, there's this pressure of how do I keep up on this information? So whether it's email, which is which is always quite enclosed, it's private, it's not transparent emails. If it's in Teams or Slack, some people are using it like this. If you're not part of this conversation, you're going to miss out. That's readily available. And that puts a pressure to keep up with the conveyor belt of information. And that's not where the tools are there to sort of support. And that's why the culture yeah. is really important. So if you can start to coach your company and your organization to start to think about how do we manage notifications better so that people don't have these constant interruptions, that's always a great starting point. So just coaching people of when to at someone, when not to at someone, also moving away from, especially just now, like, People aren't readily available. A lot of people are homeschooling. A lot of people have got like, pets. They've got a lot of worries, financial worries. So moving away from that um, green dot type, uh, sort of always available, always on. Um, because what you're seeing just now is, I, I don't know if, if you're the same, but a lot of people I'm talking to are exhausted by the end of the day. And when I asked them, what have you kind of achieved? Like these are just friends and, and families. A lot of them were like, oh, I'm so busy today. But they can't really tell you what they've done. <laughs> because it have been like lots of meetings, lots of interruptions, lots of emails. So by changing the culture and the dynamic and reducing the interruptions, you actually start to become more productive rather than busy. Um, so yeah, busy busyness is one of these terrible things, and especially in office organizations where it's kind of worn as a badge of honor. Um, so remote working really moves you towards that productivity over visibility. Um, but you need your culture to sit behind that and really drive that, and that needs to come from the top as well. So yeah. Yeah, I love that idea. I think it's it's totally true. Um, I mean, I, people always say to me that I could sit in a, an empty room and then be busy. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? There's nothing there. I always find myself just that constant, like, you know, it's okay. And I really do feel that now I've got maybe that time to kind of like sit back and be like, right, what am I doing today? I actually said to my, to my message yesterday, I was really busy yesterday. But if someone asked me what I did, I'd be like, you know, what did I actually get? What, what was the achievements? Um, for anyone, I got those done. It was great. And that's a good thing. <laughs> like, but, but... Yeah, but the great thing is you, you're doing something that we always sort of recommend to people is you need to have that self-discipline. And, and yes, there's guidance that an organization can give you and there's support, but you need to be self-disciplined in terms of making sure you are blocking out time. And that may be something you have to like deliberately do at first, like blocking out time in your diary. Like I remember... 10 years ago, I would block out time in my diary to take breaks and take lunch and bec- until it became a behavior where I wasn't thinking about it anymore. And that's really important. And it's difficult because in certain organizations, there's a pressure of, okay, they've like you, you, people can see each other's calendar sometimes and there might be a question of, oh, that's nice for them. They're blocking out lunch for themselves. But really step back and think about it. Like That's so important because you're just going to burn out otherwise. And I think if you get to a position where you're very focused on these are the outcomes we're trying to achieve, let's try and focus on those to achieve those outcomes and try and reduce that noise that comes with it. But Mm -hmm. it's progressive. It's it's something that happens over time and it's constantly evolving as well. So, But it's good that you've started. (laughs) Oh, no, totally. I know, yeah. yeah. It was really good to get see it in there. It's just like, it's the focus time. I'm like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> um it, it is really interesting i think it's a really good a, a tool they've got and it even tells you analytics end of the month like you had these busy days these meetings you attended you checked emails and this it tells you how many how long you waited to check an email and stuff like that and i'm like oh so i've moved you know i've tried to kind of like 
push it back and not be handcuffed to the to the email. But there is the yeah. times when you get an email in with like a fifteen minute deadline or something, and you're like, oh, you know, that's what it is. Well, that's, yeah, and, that, and that's where like as long as the organisation know when something's urgent and when something's not. Like um, I remember in one um, kind of incumbent organisation where I used to work, like there was a period where myself, my team, I started to encourage them to put it out of office on constantly, which said, look, we'll be looking at emails between 9 and 9.30 and 4 and 4.30. If anything's really urgent, give us a call. And, and, oh, at, really? first, and at first it was kind of frowned upon as in, mm-hmm. well, who do they think they are? <laughs> like, when you start to talk <laughs> through the, but that's a cultural thing. When you start to talk through the rationale, mm-hmm. actually people start to see the value. And it was funny because you started to see other people replicating that because you shouldn't really. I mean, that's the difficult thing. Have an email open constantly. If you just hear the ping or if you've not managed your notifications, yeah. I mean, it's super easy because you're like, oh, I should really check that because that's just human nature, isn't it? So, um, yeah. It's a total good thing, I think, having set times that you're checking your emails so you do get kind of locked into them. Yeah. Um, but obviously, I, you know, when, when BIT kind of went into remote working like many companies did, um, you know, we've had MS Teams for a while, obviously, you know, to kind of replace, um, you know, Skype for business. Um, we would used it for a little bit, but not really adopted it massively. So it was kind of turned on. I went through and created all the kind of sub teams and stuff in BIT, um, created all the channels and things like that. Um, and I mean, I love it. So it looks so organized. Um, but there's so much going on. So we've got all different areas and you just got a wee ding, 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 ding. Yeah. <laughs> all these things going off. So it's... And that's the thing, like, yeah, the, the technology, sorry to jump in, the technology is great because it enables you, but one of the things I always say is the tool is not the goal. So these tools really enable you, but you need the culture and the mindset to sit above that. So, I mean, like I, I've spoke to people in the past and um, I was at Slack Frontiers conference a couple of years ago and they were using uh, Monzo, the FinTech bank, as an example, and they had like yeah. 800 channels. Um, and when I spoke to Monzo's community afterwards um, about the managing of that, and they were very evolved and very progressive in terms of they had the right naming conventions. People only asked these people when it was related to them. So actually, although you've 800 channels, you're not really overwhelmed and you don't feel a pressure to go in. And you can use the my activity or my feed um, so you can just go in and see what's relevant to you. And, and that's really important because... I mean, you'll know yourself, a larger organization are going to have multiple teams and multiple yeah, channels. So absolutely. having those naming conventions and manage notifications, all that stuff's super important. Um, otherwise, people are just going to, they're going to see it as an additional thing to email that they need to manage and, and work through. And actually, it should be complementary and it should support them being more productive. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, totally. And you can go and like bespoke, like manage the notifications. You don't have to have everything that's turned on to... Yeah. you know straight off the bat kind of thing you can go and like, that one's important i can just check that one now and again kind of thing so exactly yeah yeah i mean it gives you the control and um, what works for you and that, that comes back to that self-discipline some people might be comfortable with the notifications coming through because they can focus on their work i'm the type of person that i only have notifications set up for one or two things um, and i use do not disturb quite often as a status because uh, yeah. i want to just go into something and really make sure that i'm being productive and getting something done so yeah mm-hmm. no totally and what about then looking at kind of like work-life balance and obviously how important that is? And that's been, you know, the lines can be easily blurred um, yeah. because we're walking into another room in our own house. Um, yeah. how, what's your advice on kind of like, you know, maintaining that remotely? Yeah, so I think if we focus, obviously right now, let's put that aside because right now is, like I said before, it's, it's about being yeah. at home trying to work. So I think the what you're seeing at the moment is a lot of people who are being perceived as remote working at the moment aren't really remote working because they've got all these additional pressures, anxieties. And what that might actually do is, and I I sort of wrote a piece on this a couple of months ago around this won't be remote work silver bullet. It may accelerate the ways of working. And that's because of that. A lot of people who have maybe never worked remotely before must be thinking right now, oh my God, is this remote work? I I, I can't wait to get back in office. A lot of people will be thinking that, but I think for those people, my message would be this isn't remote work. And actually give yourself the opportunity once things start to normalize and kids go back to school and things start to get a little bit more back to back to usual, then maybe start to experiment with remote working because from a mindfulness, from a well-being perspective, all these different aspects, it can be really, really great. It can be super beneficial for your life. Like mm-hmm. you, you're starting what remote work really does is you start to shape your work around your life rather than the other way about, if that makes sense. So 
gone are the days of work dictates when you go to appointments or when you do different things actually you can start to shape your your work around your life so um self-discipline is important um but yeah i think uh from a mindfulness perspective there's a lot of things that you should do when you're working so the social aspect is one that a lot of people say they're like oh i love being in an office because you can chat with people and go out to the pub and, yeah. and stuff like that so when you're working remotely like the thing is if there's going to be these satellite offices, there'll still be those opportunities to have those catch-ups and meetups. And with remote teams that I've had before, I would always get us together every kind of month or quarter, all together as a team. We wouldn't do anything related to work. We'd just catch up, get together, grab a bite to eat, do some activities, like grab a drink or what have you. But when you're working remotely, it's just more deliberate, the social aspect. It's not diminished by any means. So yeah. you're seeing a re-energization of... I don't even know if that's a word, but we'll go with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's there's a new energy into the kind of local communities, and what you see is you start to reconnect with your family and your friends at a deeper level. You start to connect more with local communities. So things like myself, I'll I'll maybe work from, and I'm very fortunate because I've got a room in the house which is my home office, and that's something I learned very early, and um, just from some of the stuff I've read up in psychology and. Actually, if you don't have that boundary between, say, a living room or a dining room in your workplace, it can then start to be quite impactful in, in terms of uh, your mindset and your well-being. Anyone who's lived in a, a studio flat will probably it'll resonate with them. It's like the barrier between where you sleep and where you live, and you can have trouble sleeping in that environment. But when you're doing the more deliberate side of the social element, it's, you know what, I might go down to my local cafe just now and, and work from there for an hour or two, mm-hmm. start to chat and meet people there. You have the ability, because you're not doing commutes for two hours a day or three hours a day, or if you're in London, yeah. even more, yeah. where, you know what, I can start to do some new hobbies, new activities, meet some new people. Because I think this concept of, I miss all my mates in the office, but you need to remember that those mates were chosen by your bosses who hired them. And yeah. therefore who's to say you wouldn't have created really good relationships and connections even if you hadn't had an office by having more hobbies more activities more impact in your local community there's also other things that you need to look at from a company's perspective i mean definitely supporting people there's lots of virtual apps and things that progressive companies do so whether that's gym memberships co-working space memberships which i do think will diminish because of everything that's happening at the moment but also mindfulness meditation giving people the guidance to maybe start to learn that new skill and and there's some great apps out there like headspace and calm Um, and i'd really advocate that because it's it's really powerful i've been kind of meditating for about six years now and it's been a life changer in terms of just slowing the pace down being a lot more present when that comes to meetings and your work and your family life um, and also you're you're seeing like i don't know if you've seen chris hemsworth's um center app yeah. um, which is awesome because he's combining the meditation mm-hmm. uh, the diets and all the digital workouts as well and, and like i've tried a few of them and they are hard <laughs> like, he's, 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 some, he's size of that guy eh? oh he's, yeah yeah they're all yeah yeah there's, there's some really but they, but they do a lot of kind of yoga and stretching and stuff and that's stuff that you can do without equipment in your garden in your house so yeah and and like i say when it's kind of back to normal a little bit a lot of the progressive remote companies give people who are working remotely allowances for kind of the ergonomics like chairs like thinking about their workspace or desks they give them gym memberships actual memberships to the apps so there's lots of different things but it's actually like i said it's just a bit more deliberate and a bit more structured um but I would say after working 13 years and a lot of people that I know in the remote working space, like it's certainly not diminished once you get into that flow. But it is something you need to learn because um, when when we wrote Ready for Remote, the book, like we got Stephen who um, Stephen Gruber. So Stephen wrote one of the chapters and it's a brilliant chapter because he talks about coming from that institutionalized office environment to remote where... Um, so I was managing them and it was very much like this is this is the outcomes that we're working towards. I don't really care when you do it. I'm measuring you on the outcomes. Like So I'll make sure you're highly aligned, but you've got the autonomy to go and figure that out as and when you need to. These are the times I kind of need you to be available if, if we need uh, to have conversations. But he really struggled with that like initially and it, I kind of call it the guilt curve where if you've got the right people, you're not working about. You're not worried about whether they're working. You're worried about them overworking. Um, mm. because all of a sudden Stephen was like, "All right, okay, I, I can take my kids to school now, and I can go to an appointment. And actually, I'm a bit of a night owl, so I kind of like doing large portions of work at night. 
but then he had this tendency of kind of, oh, I feel really privileged to have this. I should be doing more. I should be doing more. So it was uh-huh. constant coaching conversations, regular conversations with people like that to just sort of guide them and steer them in the direction of they've got the right support. Listen, this isn't about you. Like if you achieve your work in four hours for the outcome, great. I'm not expecting you to sit in front of a computer for seven and a half hours because you feel like you need yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, so, like you, need, you need to earn it. Like you need to earn it. Yeah, absolutely. It's so it's kind of like, yeah, it's moving away from work to live, live to work yeah. to just live and shape your work around that. Um, but yeah, that that there's obviously different um, things that need to happen for that. Um, and we touched on it in the book and the checklist, like things like a large proportion of your work should be mediated through a, a screen or a device to enable you to work that way. Um, yeah. Because let's be honest, not all jobs can be remote. I think 54% of UK jobs can't be remote. So this isn't about everybody going remote. But yeah, um, it's, it's interesting, the dynamic and the well-being. But I definitely hear that a lot. Like, And it happens like you've got a lot of extroverted personalities, introverted personalities. So it's just trying to make it work for what works for them. And a lot of those guys might prefer satellite offices or coffee shops. But yeah. they've got the freedom to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, fantastic. I mean, I think I'm always kind of looking back at BIT and thinking about the organisation and thinking about, you know, um, you know, recruitment agencies have always had an office. You know, they've had the floor, they've had, you know, the recruiters working there. You know, let's you know, create that environment and things like that, you know, and, and get the guys going and get them pumped and stuff like that. Because um, it's a very challenging, you know, roller coaster like um, position to have. Yeah, I think it just creates. I'm I'm a big advocate of you know working from home, having that flexibility. I think you definitely, you know, if you create that environment where you can go for a run at lunch, people can go walks in the morning, you know, they can go out with their partner at lunchtime. You're just creating so much like uh, mindfulness, like you know, much calm. And then when you get back into work, you can get back and refocus, and it's just going to create yeah. a better outcome overall. And that's you know? the thing. If you can slow down the pace of people's minds, and that's where meditation and mindfulness is really powerful and exercise as well. But if you can get people to become a lot more present and not worry about the past and not think too far ahead and just be in the moment, um, then that becomes really powerful. And and you see that in meetings a lot. I don't know, like there's a lot of meetings I used to go in in offices where people would bring their laptop and you'd be sitting beside them and they'd be doing their emails while they were in the meeting or they'd have their phone out. And so they're not present. There's no point. Whereas with remote working, um, if you do have a meeting, and I'm always the kind of mindset, a meeting should be like in a last resort um, because you should have the ability to write up the communication, allow different time zones to consume that. And you can also use video, and I do this quite a lot with show and tells. Of, mm-hmm. um, so, for instance, I, there was a deck that I did um, just a couple of days ago in the company that I'm working with at the moment. And normally they've kind of gone around and done this deck in front of 25, 30 people. So I was like, spun up a quick um, stream video, Microsoft Stream, or you can use things like Loom, recorded my screen. I was on the screen as well, annotated on it, showed what it was about. Four minutes, there you go, consume it when you need. And then let's have a chat if we need to have a chat about it. So it's moving towards that so that people can be a bit more present in terms of what they're doing and deeper focus. So yeah, absolutely. That's a really good idea. You're not kind of like pulling people in. They've all got different diaries. You can even do it on MS Teams. I'm totally promoting Microsoft, eh? You, yeah, know, you, yeah. it, you can record, you record the presentation. You're down in the bottom corner, you know, chatting through um, the slides and stuff like that. It's there. It's in SharePoint as well if he wants to go back to it at a later point as well. That's it, yeah. That's and you it. can you can fire up directly out of stream as well. Like Loom's a different tool because it kind of um, gives you some more annotations and stuff. But yeah, I use Stream and Microsoft to do that quite a lot. Um, yeah. And that's moving more to that asynchronous kind of non-real time communication. And when you start to have a broader distributed company, that's really important, especially when you've got multiple time zones because people aren't readily available and right now. So. And that's one of the cultural shifts that I talk about is moving away from the kind of synchronous meeting to meeting to meeting culture to let's go as as asynchronous as possible. There's always going to be a level of meetings and catch ups on all hands. But actually yeah, recording the information, if you're doing show and tells and celebrating those kind of things, um, writing up comprehensively, maybe your checkouts and updates. So a digital delivery team might be a great example, whereas the past in an office a digital team might all sit together and they're doing daily stand-ups and then they're doing retrospectives and they're doing show and tells. Well, um, over time, we progress that when we're working remotely to, you know what, we'll have a stand-up on a Monday if, if we need to do that because we'll get the guys together and we'll, we'll focus them on, on what we're working towards for that week, what are the kind of barriers. But then after that, we shifted away from daily stand-ups to 
checkout channel. So we created a checkout channel on Teams and Slack. And within that, basically it gave people the freedom to write up a comprehensive checkout, let us know how they progressed against the outcome they're working on, what are the barriers. I, as a leader, can consume that whenever I need to. We're not asking everyone to jump on a call and waste an hour or an hour and a half giving status updates. And then yeah. at the end of the week, you've got the ability to do a show and tell rather than like everyone jump on a meeting, which you can do, but people were maybe encouraged to say, right, just record what you've kind of done, what you've achieved and ping it into there and people can consume it. So again, again, you're just moving away from that. I need to be available right now and jump on a meeting because mm -hmm. that just constantly impacts on what you're able to produce in terms of uh, in your, on your work side and the productivity. So yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. It sounds so... Uh, so much better than having because I suppose when you're going through updates and stuff you could be if you've got four people on a call you'd be on that call for an hour where you yeah. say like give us your update here's you know to the manager to the head of whatever here's my update and there's no reason why that can't uh, be visible yeah I mean I mean there's great tools out there again which enable that there's Trello there's Jira there's Planner Microsoft Planner um, and that's a great place for things like status updates to be shifted. So whether it's digital delivery or whether it's product teams, creating a planner board, for example, for using Microsoft planner yep. board, here's the swim lanes, here's our backlog, here's in progress, here's up next, sorry, up next, in progress, completed and archived. Let's make sure we've got a visible master board for the senior stakeholders where they can see the status of the work. They don't need to have updates constantly because they've got the ability to go in. And you as a worker who's been assigned one of those cards or tasks, it's your responsibility to update those, to move those. And that then starts to become your transparent company-wide visibility. And then you've got a secondary board with the details in it that people can go into if they want. So yeah, we kind of advocate the power of that, the the task management and the workflow, moving that to a digital format as well. Because, I mean, it was Jason Fried and, um, from Basecamp who said it, like that example you just gave there, the four people in an hour-long meeting, that's a four-hour meeting. It's not a one-hour meeting. Yeah. It's, there's four people in it, so you're eating yeah. into four hours of productive time to give status yeah. updates that could be written. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, it's completely, it's such a, it's so uh, eye-opening to see that. And I think people watching this, managers in any organisation, I think what's happened is obviously, you know, it's not the normal remote working, as you say, we're in the, the pandemic, the lockdown. Um, it's difficult to work in this kind of environment. But I think uh, the change is that people, managers have just been kind of told, right, go remote work with your team. No one said, here's the yeah. remote book. Uh, no one said, you know, here's training on it. No one said, this is how we should be doing it. You know, some companies, I suppose, will try to be doing that at the moment. But when it first yeah. happened, you know, it was kind of like, grab a hold off you go um, and that's the know, thing and I think people have kind of come over that ebb and they're starting to feel a little bit deflated and exhausted now because like I said there was that energy at the start of people yeah. like right okay I'm going to set up a dining room and set up this and you saw it even with the, the homeschooling like I've seen it with my own daughter like <laughs> she was super energized at first yeah. and then she's like oh my god because I've never homeschooled before so it's a great example that I gave earlier of people haven't remote worked before it's yeah. something you need to kind of evolve and learn and it's it's challenging right now because this isn't normal situations and um, but yeah it's just giving people the guidance and the little tips that they can start to evolve and um, because at the moment people have kind of been bundling their way through it so some of the conversations i've had have been really great in terms of um some organizations are already thinking about right, okay actually yep we we have the ability to rethink our ways of working we're starting to experiment with that which is always a great way to start and they're starting to look at what's our longer term strategy because you know yourself there's so much tactical thinking and um, you really need to be able to sit back and say right, okay actually we can become quite a progressive organization more productive happier employees if we start to rethink our ways of working um, and the tools and technology that supports us so um, but it's great because it gives people a kind of flavor of how digital tools can support them and enable them so yeah oh completely um what about then gary uh, predictions for uh, the future yeah um <laughs> so i was i always go back to there was a guy um who's my boss years ago he used to always say you need to step back from running 10 years ahead um because <laughs> i used to always like talk about we can start to do these uh, really smart progressive things but mm -hmm. it's just a step change i think like i mentioned it in a couple of the different sessions that i've done so far this isn't really a silver bullet for remote work i think it'll accelerate the change of new ways of working and um, for those people that can rethink it um I think for me, it's kind of the folks that are looking at that longer term strategy. I think you're going to see a big impact on commercial real estate. I think there's no doubt about that. I think people are going to look at 
do we actually need the spaces? And you've heard a lot of incumbent organizations, Barclays, great example, their CEO last month is saying, you know what, I'm starting to think it's maybe not a great idea to have 3,000 people sat in the same office in the same city. Um, you're starting to see enlightened people sit back in and start to question, you know what, is there a better way of doing this? And that's understandable just now because before they were so in the, this is just the way we do it. Um, so that's one of the positives that have come out of this. I think what you'll see is a kind of mix when we start to go back, I think you'll see some organizations that are desperate to get back in the office. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of naysayers of remote work and what they'll be looking at is they'll not be looking through the lens of what I've been saying where this isn't remote work right now. They'll be thinking this is remote work and it's a disaster and I can't yeah. wait to get back to the office rather than thinking, well, actually let's consider we're in lockdown so I can't do any social aspect. I am trying to homeschool or I'm, I've got all these different anxieties. I've got all these uh, financial worries. So I think that'll give them the fuel to say, yeah, I told you so. Let's get back in the office. Yeah. I do think you have a lot of employees who maybe have seen some of the benefits will start to question why why am I commuting two hours a day and then multiplying that by five and then multiplying that by, across a year and then starting to look at, oh my God, right, I'm losing a month or 25 days a year just sitting in a car or sitting on a train and going to an office. Yeah. Um, for what? So I think you'll get a lot of people maybe starting to question that where they can and pushing it back. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely what I'd like to see is some of those enlightened leaders starting to experiment um, with the new ways of working. Um, and, and they can do that. They'll have the ability to do that. I think um, digital transformation has always been this big buzzword for the last 10 years. Yeah. And I think the reality is, I think it's really difficult to transform your business digitally, especially when you're an incumbent. I think most successful companies in the world have created a, a sub-brand or a subsection, which has started fresh with a, a really progressive technology infrastructure, new ways of working, culture, starting really lean, feeling the pinch of where they need to go. So what they start to do is grow that business. And then there's this tipping point of their existing business starts to decrease and the revenues of their new business start to grow. And then they can maybe migrate some of the people that they want to migrate across. So like GE Capital is a great example of that. They kind of, they hold themselves up as a company who digitally transformed, but they didn't really, they just created a new digital business that sat outside their incumbent business, but they set it up in a new way with new ways of working and new technology. And that now accounts for almost half their revenue already. And they're starting to grow that. So I think organizations that can maybe spin off and, and some organizations have tried to do that maybe unsuccessfully. So you've seen in the financial services, they've maybe spun up sub brand products and created new teams and new ways of working. But that's the beauty of it as well. It's disposable where it doesn't impact your brand. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that will start to progress. I think you'll have more companies doing a lot more sub brands, a lot more sub organizations, if that makes sense to try and experiment. Um, and look at that long-term um, strategy. So yeah, yeah, no, completely. Really good ideas there. A lot to unpack as well. I mean, in yeah. terms of making it clear to people as well, because I always say that there's no, there is a there always is a difference. Um, I mean, you go and look on Wikipedia and stuff. The difference between like remote working, working from home, and agile working. Do you want to give a a, a kind of brief? Because people will just think yeah. working from home. But then there's yeah. obviously, you know, the not, it's not the nine to five kind of thing for agile working and stuff. Yeah. So what you're seeing just now, like, and I've kind of had a chuckle to myself over the last couple of months because I've all of a sudden I've seen this rise of remote remote experts and um <laughs> and obviously a lot of opportunists and I totally get that. Like I understand that certain people are trying to drive new business and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think what you'll see is when you listen to maybe remote experts or remote advocates, so those are the people that are trying to create this cult mass following. A lot of the stuff they talk about is the nomadism, the, hey, let's go down to a beach and work. The reality of all the studies and all the information is that when people have the freedom to work from anywhere, 85, 84% of the time, they work from home. That was yep. the last remote working study. So there's a reality there of people do choose to work from home when they've got the freedom. It just gives them more freedom to shape their lives. So actually, if you're younger, yeah, absolutely go traveling like you've got the freedom to do that and work from lots of exotic places but yeah. for the vast majority of us who have commitments and financial commitments and um, you're going to be working from home so i think the difference between temporary working from home days and remote working is is really important this is a great point a great question because working from home and you touched upon it earlier you maybe work from home one day a week or one day a fortnight if you do that then actually the 
the ability to miss out on important information is, is quite limited. You're, you're not going to be that impacted because you're going to be back in the office the next day or a couple of days later. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're remote working or working um, in a distributed manner, whatever the terminology that people want to use, you're actually potentially out of the office for weeks or months at a time. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if you miss out on information, <clears throat> excuse me, that's really impactful. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where the mindset and the culture is really important. So although I touched upon everyone's throwing technology, I understand why they're throwing technology because it's what they know, but they yeah. really need to craft the principles, the mindset, the kind of remote first, asynchronous first approach what are those digital ways of working and really start to not just make a playbook and create a guidebook because that that's great to give people guidance but you really need to coach people and you need to reinforce those behaviors um where the agile part comes in so it's a difficult one like the agile manifesto was written in 2001 in fact 1997 i think it was actually yeah 1997 I mean, it's been around for ages. I think it's something, it's a term that's sadly become commercialized by a lot of large consultancies like Bain, McKinsey, Accenture, who are generating a lot of cash um, by using or forget, for, forgive me, but like bastardizing the term of agile. So, I mean, whether you call it Kanban, Scrum, Agile, I mean, what you're really looking at is a digital way of working. It's a digital delivery. So, um, yeah, it's a shift towards that kind of, here's the alignment we're going to make a really highly aligned organization so people are very clear what we're trying to achieve what the outcomes are working towards but we're going to give them the autonomy because if you want to keep really talented people within your organization you need to let them figure out how to solve problems because that's what they're motivated by Um, and i think that's really important and when i was recruiting um, the remote guys within different teams in the past and a lot of the progressive companies that there are those principles it's about people that are motivated by getting things done people who they kind of want to know the gory details up front so in an interview just be real with them because actually you know you've got the right person because those those really super talented people they're they're motivated by challenges by solving problems um you want to tap into as as low an ego as possible (laughs) which is probably the hardest part to ascertain um but there's nothing more destructive to a team dynamic than than an egotistical person so low ego is motivated by getting things done super important um but the agile aspect is really just something that has become I mean, I don't even know how it's uh, perceived now. It's become so yeah. like changed in terminology. So that's yeah. why I wanted you to clean it up because it just it's thrown about everywhere. Like I'm agile working. Are you? Um, so, what is yeah, it? Not, yeah. My, yeah. <laughs> I was about to say. So my, my wife's in the NHS, and I've heard them talk about agile, and I do have a yeah. smile on my face, and she kind of laughs. She's like, she gets angry. She's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, you're not really using the term the right way. Like it's not agile. Doesn't mean like a certain thing it's just a digital way of working it's a Mm -hmm. it's a way of working (laughs) that's all it is it's it's just been kind of commercialized so um yeah i think for me like the best thing that organizations can do is start to look at right okay how do we give people freedom because that's what people want the choice where possible because like i said earlier on 54 percent of jobs can't be remote so where possible give them the freedom give them the alignment the autonomy plug in the tools that can enable them, but really work hard on that mindset and that culture because that's the biggest shift. It's going to be super challenging to do that um, yeah. for a lot of organizations. So. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, you're obviously very knowledgeable about your, your, your subject matter, uh, Gary. It's been uh, amazing um, you know, chatting to you. What's uh, Obviously, you're very busy with Ready for Remote just now, I can imagine. Um, but what's next? What's next for you? What's next for, for Ready for Remote? Um, yeah, so I'm kind of always of the mindset of slow and steady, like not massive acceleration of growth and things like that. I think it's important to validate the different products and services, make sure yep. that there's the right market fit. Um, so like anybody else, creating a capital runway, so working with companies um, still um, in terms of contract work, etc. But from a ready for remote perspective, it's an exciting time. So um, obviously wrote the book about almost two years ago. So the vast majority of it's relevant. There's some newer tools probably out there yeah. now, but I've captured them on readyforremote.com and, mm-hmm. and the evolution of readyforremote.com is going to be interesting. So um, so what I've done is some interesting partnerships. So um, around the toolkit um, that's part of readyforremote.com where people can get an understanding of the tools categorized of how they can help them whether it's mindfulness tools or workflow tools or recruitment tools in there. 
Um, there's the curation of job boards. So if people want to hire people, some of the best remote working organizations and agencies out there for hiring, also for finding jobs. Um, but what I've started to do is just adjust the services that we offer. So in the past, we've done, I wouldn't call them sprints, because again, sprints, another terminology yes. like Agile, it's been yeah. kind of uh, bastardized. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think the larger services we would normally do is very much going into an organization, understanding the digital maturity of the business. So um, a kind of virtual health survey, a lot of sort of questions, that kind of initial 20 days piece of work, depending on the scale of the company, giving people assets off the back of it. So it's not like a long-term commitment, but obviously people are, it's quite flat just now. So lots of people have come to me and said, oh, you must be mobbed. But yeah, I'm, I'm really busy in terms of the guidance and the, maybe the, the video calls and the yep. workshops about remote, but actually, you know yourself, companies are really tightening the purse strings at the minute they're evaluating how they're going to survive this so yeah. for me what we've done is we created a couple of lightweight services and i've partnered up with them so we're, we're also partnered with uh, distribute consulting so they're part of uh, an american brand where they do some really interesting stuff on kind of smart cities and just uh, remote working consultancy okay. um so partnering up with them as a sub brand um, and then we're able to offer some kind of leadership consultancy um, so that's like one hour sessions, case for change um, options as well. Some really lightweight and even the virtual health assessment. So giving people the ability to pay a small fee to be able to go through that process. Um, and we're just really mindful of that. Long term, the, the, the plan is to really shape readyforremote.com into an ecosystem where anyone who's getting ready for remote employees or companies can start to go into that platform to get everything they need, whether it's insight, resources, learning content. Yeah. Um, the toolkit itself and, and we may move that into a more subscription based model moving forward but yeah just for now it's, it's slow and steady we've got a good traction and a lot of good visitors coming along um, but yeah yeah just trying to help people where possible at the moment is, is really what we've been doing more than more than anything so yeah that's awesome and I'll pay dividends back to you I mean it's a fantastic company I mean you've worked with companies like you know Microsoft Logitech Forbes um, 3 like New York Times like you've got some amazing um, organisations you've worked with, um, you know, and I think you guys will just keep keep growing totally, especially what we've been going through and companies trying, you know, hopefully starting to think about things more in regards yeah. to remote working and stuff as you go through this. But no, that's been that's been awesome, Gary. Thank you uh, so much for uh, for chatting with me. No problem. Really enjoyed great. it. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Thanks very much. Some great All questions right. in there. So yeah, cheers. Thanks cool. again.